Kia ora whanau. welcome to our service today. Hey, if you've got any talent uh, or a creative spark or an idea of what we could add to our service, what you think might work really well with what we're doing, please get in touch with me. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts and, and some of your creative ideas that would really bless me in particular, uh, if you can uh, just share that with me. Today's service is going to be just slightly different, uh, in particular with real life, with all that's going on in the world, especially with uh, the Ukraine in particular, which has been on my heart quite a bit lately. Um, I, I, we just thought rather than focusing inwardly or the stories from within us, that you know, every once in a while I might just pop in a story from outside of us um, and just be aware of how our fellow brothers and sisters are engaging with the world in their context. So today's uh, normal episode of Real Life is actually gonna be called Real World. Uh, next week, we'll get back into our, you know, connecting with people, but uh, just pray that uh, hearing Ludmina's story that she might challenge you uh, in how you can then share your faith and engage with people in your community, in your spaces. So God bless you. May God challenge you this morning from through what you may hear and see. Open your hearts. I pray, uh, let the Holy Spirit work through you. In Jesus' name. Elijah and the prophets of In my lifetime, I have experienced the rule of two totalitarian regimes. One was the German Nazis, and the second was the Russian Communists. The Word of God says 366 times, do not be afraid, do not fear. So we weren't afraid. After 40 years of communism here, the fact that many believers left the country, the Czech Republic has been called the most atheist place in Europe. It breaks my heart. My name is Ludmila Hararova. I'm 82 years old. I have seven grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. My husband went to heaven in 2002. The Lord Jesus told me, now he is my husband, and he wants to continue to use me. He wants me to be his representative, his ambassador. Next to the door of my house, there is a bronze sign that says, the embassy of the kingdom of heaven. My home is an extension of Christ's kingdom. It's a place where people can come and look for help if they're in trouble or have a need. 
The Bible says the kingdom of heaven is joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. That is the atmosphere I want here at the embassy. The visitors that I get, some of them have called ahead to let me know they're coming, and some just come. The ones that haven't called are usually the best ones because I'm not prepared for them. Everything that happens is dependent on the Lord. Today a dear friend came by. She's a widow and her family really are struggling financially. Whenever people enter this house, I just lay everything else aside and spend time with them. I have learned to recognize the inner voice of the Holy Spirit and give Him room to use me. The Holy Spirit likes to take control. Often I listen to myself and I'll say things I wouldn't even think about. There is no problem to deal with the issues that people bring when they come here because the Holy Spirit is here. It's an honor for me to be an instrument of God's love and His wisdom every day. We often don't realize that all believers are called to be representatives of the Kingdom of Heaven. We are all ambassadors. The Lord Jesus didn't choose to do it any other way. He simply entrusted us. Good morning, church family. I hope you're well in managing and what is a stressful time for many navigating sickness and periods of isolation due to COVID. If anyone is struggling with illness, isolation, or you just need a friendly chat, please don't hesitate to contact our awesome church care team, Jean Rhodes, Keith Vaughan, Penelope Trout, Pam Hill, Maggie Barker, or Rob. Their contact number is in the newsletter. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, even though we are in separate places, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together to worship you. Father, we lift up those in our country, our friends, our family, our neighbours and workmates who are sick or isolating due to COVID. We lift those families who face economic hardship, loss of jobs and have lost family members in this pandemic. Father, we particularly pray for our healthcare workers dealing with a stretched system and for teachers and students having to manage disrupted education services. Father, where there is anxiety, please bring your peace and comfort. Help us to respond, not just in words, but with actions that reflect your heart. Lord, we pray for the war in Ukraine. We pray for an end to the hostilities and that a peaceful resolution for the conflict can be found. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones in homes and are now displaced. Lord, we pray for our world leaders for wisdom as they respond to this crisis. 
Lord, I pray for our Heart City Baptist family, that each person would know your love, peace and presence this week. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Getting into this morning's sermon, and we're continuing our series on the Christian atheist. We're into part six. And look, the whole thing about this series is just kind of challenging us Christians. We're so really good at challenging others that sometimes we fail to see ourselves. Um, we tend to point out to the world where God is missing, and yet we ourselves act as though God does not exist in our own lives. Um, so the challenge with this series is to continually just looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, oh, where is God in my life? Rather than pointing the finger at others, let me look inwardly at myself. 
I want to share these three verses with you, and they will just kind of get us into uh, this morning's topic. Um, but take a look at them, and then I'll give you some time to kind of reflect on a question I have for them. But straight to the verses. Here's the first verse. Mark 4.20. Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. The second verse comes from Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. It says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And then the last verse is Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So I want to challenge you. I've just shared those three verses with you. I'm going to put them back on in a second. And I'm going to ask you, what is it that ties these three verses together? If you're with friends or, or, or with, with family around you, take some time. Have a look at these verses. I'm actually not going to ask you to pause because I'm going to put on a little bit of elevator music while you guys are going to sit around and discuss what could be the thing that ties these three verses together. Take a look. Have you been able to figure out what it is that ties these three things together? Um, it is a difficult thing. I mean, what I'm trying to point out is something that most of us may not even notice when we look at Scripture. So if you found this, man, kudos to you. You, you know your word very well, um, and you know what I'm going on about here. But these three verses have one thing in particular. Take a look at this. In Matthew 4.20, the word left. In Matthew 18:21, the word forgive, and in Matthew 27 verse 50, the word, the two words gave up. Now the funny thing about those three words, they're actually the one word in Greek, believe it or not, one word that's translated three different ways, but meaning really in essence, the same thing. It's that Greek word aphiemi, aphiemi. It means basically, to forgive, but it also means to leave, to let go, to give up, to to to, to uh, kind of expunge. <laughs> it's it's a word that has a lot of meaning and a lot of depth, not just simply in our language, forgive, which is why the word is used in different ways uh, in the Bible to mean different things, but the same thing. Um, so obviously, the question that we're faced with today is this, forgiveness, forgiveness. As Christian atheists, this idea of forgiveness is actually very difficult for us, which, which is funny. Why is it so difficult for us? Why is it difficult for us? to forgive. And I'm not saying, because uh, <laughs> I've heard it many, many, and I can't even begin to tell you across all different countries I've worked with and different cultures, it's the same. No, no, I forgive, but I won't forget. Or, you know, no, I, I'll forgive them, but they better not do it again. <laughs> you know, there's this real uh, way of responding. I will not forgive. Or, I will forgive. I really will. But anyone face, <laughs> and I'm overemphasizing it. Absolutely, absolutely overemphasizing it. But think about it for a moment. When when you've been hurt, it's the hardest thing for us is to forgive. And yet, I don't think there's many of us out there, as Christians, that wouldn't disagree with me when I say the church hurts more people than it heals sometimes. 
Many of us, I've talked to pastors, I've talked to other Christians who have left churches or are in churches and still carry scars and say, actually, the place where I've been hurt the most is the church. I can say as a pastor, I've copped more abuse in church than outside of church. People have a respect for me outside of church. Inside of church, boy, we can be really bad. And it's hard to forgive that. Well, it's hard to forgive each other. Why? Here is how important forgiveness is for God. In that verse in Matthew 18, 21, Jesus goes on to explain. You know what he says? You know, Peter comes to him and says, hey, how many times should I forgive? Is seven times okay? And Peter's actually referring to what, you know, that first, the first century rabbinic teachings were because they said, hey, look, uh, how many times should you forgive? Three times. Why? Because in the book of Amos, uh, the first two chapters talk about God forgiving. And he'll only forgive the nations of, of, of the, the Ammonites and the Moabites. He'll only forgive them three times. And so the rabbinic teaching, the way they thought through it was, well, we can't forgive more than God. So the most we can forgive people is three times. Peter's actually going beyond what, what the, the early Jews would have thought. You know, oh, three times is enough. He's saying, well, should I go up to seven? Is that enough? And Jesus just hits him with this, no, 70 times seven. In fact, it's not just three, it's not seven, it's like hundreds. I mean, more than you must probably ever have to do in a lifetime. And then he goes on to tell the story. Now, I'm going to use a cartoon to explain it to you. So just take a look at this. One day, Jesus was talking with his disciples and teaching them when Peter asked, Um, Gira? How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Jesus said, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Then Jesus told a parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to get his money back that he had let his servants borrow. While the king was doing this, one of the servants who owed him a million dollars was brought in. One million dollars, please. The servant couldn't pay, so the king ordered that he be sold along with his family and everything he owned, to pay the debt. Wait, please! But the servant begged the king, Please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his king was filled with pity for him, and he let him go and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. Uh, hi? Come here, Will. He grabbed him and demanded that he pay him back immediately. Oh, wait, please. His fellow servant begged for a little more time. He said, be patient with me and I will pay it. No. But the servant wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be punished until he had paid all that he owed. Jesus then said, That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. That's how seriously, uh, it's a great video. It's uh, cartoons at the uh, Saddleback Church in Southern California have come up for their children's ministries. It's a wonderful little story. It's cute and all of that. But the message is quite deep. Jesus is not just saying, this is how many times you need to forgive, but if you don't forgive, this is what's going to happen to you. Because God has forgiven you. Paul brings this up in Ephesians chapter 4. Take a look at this. From verse 29, he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Oh boy, I could really use that verse in the middle of a church meeting, huh? <laughs> right? Going on. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. And that's the crux, because as Christians, we believe we are forgiven. Thanks to Jesus. So if he forgave us, just like in the story, the king has forgiven us. How could we not then forgive others? Right. This is the basic of what it means to be Christian, that we are forgiven. And the challenge that we're faced with is why aren't we the first to forgive? Seeing as we've experienced this incredible forgiveness, how can we not then turn and forgive. Help me out here. What's holding us back? You see, the thing is, it's not just forgiveness. See, forgiveness is actually, from what I've read in the Bible, it's actually pretty straightforward. God is almost commanding us. You have to forgive. Uh, you can read that in one and in Colossians chapter 3, you, you can read that also in Luke chapter 4 to, to 6 to, 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 to 14. There's just all these verses that pop out that, you know, you're just hearing both Jesus and Paul telling and ex- just pushing people and saying, you need to forgive. It's almost like it's a command for us. Uh, one blog writer was writing, you know, what are the Ten Commandments of the New Testament? And number one is you need to forgive. <laughs> um, you must forgive. <laughs> so th- there's no debate on this. It costs us nothing to forgive because we ourselves have been forgiven. But you know what? What's even harder for us Christians isn't just forgiveness. It's reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is not easy. In fact, it was that difficult, that difficult, That God had to give up his only son. That Jesus had to come and die for us for reconciliation to happen. So reconciliation is not easy. And it certainly takes a lot of energy and time. But if Jesus did that for us, the question I've got to ask you is, how do we not do that with others? I can tell you, we tend to blow it off when it comes to <laughs> forgiveness. Oh, yeah, look, I forgive him. Let's move on. We won't have to talk about this ever again. Let's move on. Hear what C.S. Lewis has to say about that. We have a strange illusion that mere time cancels sin. I've heard others, and I've heard myself, recounting cruelties and falsehoods committed in boyhood as if there were no concern of the present speakers. And even with laughter. But mere time does nothing either to the fact or to the guilt of sin. The guilt is washed out not by time, but by repentance and the blood of Christ. He's hitting it on the nail there. Reconciliation, the the point of redemption, of bringing two people or peoples together, has to happen because the apartness is brokenness and sin. And the only thing that brings us together is the blood of Jesus. Hands praying. Jesus. I think we blow it off so easily. Sin. We blow it off so easily. Forgiveness. We build our ramparts and our walls and our, you know, our siege engines to just stand and fight rather than to stop and reconcile. Christ gave his life so that we could be reconciled. We're called to do the same. We're called to be like Jesus, to die, to carry our cross, to carry his mission on. Ludmina's words that we are ambassadors Oh boy, watching that video just hit me square on. 
And, 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 and she's basically calling out 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. It says this, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and though God were making, it's as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might be, become the righteousness of God. There's an, he's imploring us to connect with God, to be reconciled to him. And Jesus then implores us to be reconciled to each other. How is the church not leading in this? How is the church not at the forefront of this? How are we not at the forefront of this? How can we not live this out? What is holding us back? What is holding you back? Now, there's someone most definitely in your life that you have not reconciled with. And there is someone that you're most probably holding something against. Maybe it's time to face that because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are his ambassadors. Our mission is reconciliation and it begins with forgiveness. So how do we do that? (laughs) Lay down our lives, our pride and all of that. Turn to Jesus. I challenge you this week. Face it. Be the ambassadors of Christ. Be the leaders of reconciliation. Amen.